everyone, I'm Alexandra Jones, the editor of The Ophthalmologist, and I have the pleasure of speaking today with Dr. Robert Noecker. Dr. Noecker, could you tell me a little bit about yourself first? Hi, certainly. Thank you for having me. I'm Robert Noecker. I'm based right now in, uh, in uh, Connecticut. I have a tertiary uh, glaucoma practice, which is very surgical in nature. Um, I also teach at Yale and other medical schools. Um, so my, the focus of, I have a lot of clinical research. I do tertiary glaucoma, MIGs, and, uh, and then invasive procedures. That's great, thank you. And we're here today to talk about the micropulse transcleral laser therapy. Could you tell me how that fits into your glaucoma treatment algorithm? So that's, that's a good question. So micropulse, the short answer is it's very versatile. And so pretty much anywhere it's a treatment option. So I think because of the safety profile that Micropulse delivers to us, that um, we don't have to worry about the risks or kind of permanent damage. And I, I tend to use it in earlier, earlier in the treatment algorithm. Sometimes it's the first um, incisional glaucoma procedure or considered with the group. It's not incisional itself, but we'll use it very early when we have to move beyond the office. And the reason is because of the very good safety profile. There's certainly some people we think they're going to have a difficult time with their post-op care. Um, maybe it's just not an option to use medications. Maybe they can't use medications. Maybe it's difficult for post-operative visits. So we'll tend to use it earlier in, in those patients. On the other hand, as we know in, in glaucoma, there's some patients who we do many different things and nothing quite works, whether they failed a trabeculectomy or failed a tube or failed MIG surgery. Um, so we can use it in those cases kind of when other options have kind of run out because it works differently than just, you know, other procedures where we're putting a, basically a drain on the drainage side of the system. Um, this works more on the aqueous production side and, and uveal scleral outflow. So the, really the versatility um, makes it an extremely useful tool in my practice. Brilliant. Thank you. And please tell me about the adoption journey and the learning curve for this technology based on your own experience. So my adoption journey has been uh, quite long. So it basically, uh, as a tertiary glaucoma trained person, I have experience with transcleral psychophotocoagulation, as most fellowship trained glaucoma people have. So Actually, one of my first research projects was, was on that topic as, as a medical student. So that technology has been around, the laser-based therapy has probably been around about 30 years or so. So, but there's downsides to that. And I think traditionally, as we were taught, is you kind of reserve that technology to later in the treatment algorithm. That is patients who've kind of failed everything else and almost a last ditch, ditch effort. Um, because that technology with the continuous wave causes heating, which causes burning. Um, when you get coagulative necrosis with any burn, um, you get long lasting inflammation and you actually can get a continued effect, which can lead to hypotony or low pressure over time. So that's, that's limited using the, the continuous wave technology. On the other hand with micropulse, because of the, the breaking up of the energy, you don't can have continuous heating. The, uh, you don't cause burns and you can get the same therapeutic effect in the area of the ciliary body uh, and the pars placata, uh, but at the same time, um, you don't have the adverse event. So you can lower intraocular pressure by altering that area, aqueous production and uveal scleral outflow, but you haven't structurally changed the eye um, in terms of the other, the other tissues in the area. So based on that, it's really for me become one of my most versatile tools. I use it very early when we move out of the office, you know, beyond office-based therapy. Or once again, we can still use it in that same position where the very tertiary case is. So um, it's it's a it's an invaluable tool for a tertiary glaucoma practice. That's great. And talking from your own experience, what impact has the micropulse transcleral laser therapy had on your practice? So it's certainly, I think transcleral uh, micropulse technology is really an essential part of any of any glaucoma practice. Just as we all know, there's some things that we try um, both in the, both office based, but also um, incisional incisional surgery based. That some people nothing we try works. It's we we go through the traditional treatment algorithms, the MIGs, the 
trabeculectomies, the tubes, and their pressure is still not controlled despite all of our best efforts. So this is really a lifesaver in many of those cases. Um, and that's where I, without a doubt, I use it. I use it, you know, in those patients, if they fail a tube, probably if they fail a trabeculectomy, I'll insert it there in the treatment option. Because the other nice thing is it doesn't destroy any future options. So if we do decide to do it, we have not you know, taking scarred tissue or something like that, which will limit future options. So that's a nice thing. And so I tend to use it in the middle of the range. Um, on the other hand, we can use it very early. It saved me for patients who I think that post-op care will be difficult. Maybe they, they live a hundred miles away. It's very hard for them to come in or they have a dirty job, but they have to get back to this week. They can, we can actually do this procedure and they can return to work the next day if they choose to do so, which is really not possible with most, uh, most other traditional glaucoma procedures. So it's really over time. It's one of those things, the more you use it, the more we find applications for it. And it's something I perform every week um, when I do surgery. You recently took part in a clinical consensus panel assessing the therapy. Could you tell me what the objective was and what recommendations came from that group's work? Yes, that was, an, that was a very exciting group to be part of. So the consensus panel, the goal was to kind of look at best practices because there's a there's been a number of studies and there's a lot of studies actually in the published literature um, and adoption over time with micropulse uh, transcural therapy has been I don't say a bit hodgepodge but th there's been a lot of variation in in treatment settings so you know one doctor you know alters time for their setting other ones use different vary of total power um, so it's a little bit you know, the question was really to establish a best practice based on the literature, the published literature, science, and then also practical clinical experience of experts who do this procedure regularly and really have kind of fi fine-tuned their treatment algorithm. So this group basically was designed to come up with best certain best practices. Um, and one of the first thing we do is basically have a consensus on starting um, settings, you know, for a novice user who wanted to get started, um, Initially, just historically, probably the, the settings that recommended were a little on the low side. So they were safe, but we also we found a little bit uh, disappointing efficacy. So now this experienced user group has come to uh, consensus with best practices and recommendations at a minimum where to start and then moving forward where how to escalate dosing, patient selection, et cetera. That's great. And could you tell me what advice you would give to a colleague who might be thinking about trying the micropulse transcleral laser therapy for the first time? Yes, yeah, so I think part of it's patient selection. Um, select, you know, as we know in, in glaucoma, you know, not picking the worst patient to start with is, is always best. So just you know, increase your, your chance of success. Also, technically, uh, I usually tell them to, to do it in the operating room with some dits, some, some sedation is just better control um, and safer for the patient. Um, and also have an eye that you have good access with the laser probe, one that doesn't, you know, have something obstructing it like cine, like a symblephron or something like that. Um, that said, from our consensus panel, we decided that the, the recommended starting setting for all patients was uh, 2.5 watts um, for 80 seconds per hemisphere with a 20%, 20 second sweep rate. So 20 seconds per hemisphere. And the sweep rate is something that really hasn't been emphasized in the past. So that's kind of slowing down the delivery. So the movement of the probe, because this, pro this procedure, we move the probe as we're treating, which is somewhat different continuously versus other procedures where you kind of hold it in place, do an application, move it, do an application. So sweep speed, we recommend is 20 seconds per sweep per hemisphere. And so paying attention to that, doing it relatively slowly and thoroughly, we find that we have, you know, no matter what the patient profile, that's a very good starting point and uh, have, you know, can lead to very good uh, clinical results. Thank you for that. And finally, have you found Iridex as a company useful in introducing this therapy to surgeons? Yes, I think, I think uh, Iridex has really come a long way and I think, you know, in this last year, they've been extremely helpful um, in advancing this technology and helping us to fine tune it. I think their support has been excellent too. 
And uh, moving forward, I, th I think there's a bright future for this technology and, and Iridex has really been a, a great partner to ophthalmology in this process. Dr. Noeke, thank you so much for talking to me today about the MicroPulse transcleral laser therapy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.